Uh, good morning, class. Uh, thank you very much. I welcome you to this uh, lecture of ours on local regulation of bone development and healing. I'm very sure by now you have finalized or almost through with the head, neck, and locomotor system. And if I'm not mistaken, this week you have been handling basically the physiology and then the biochemistry and molecular biology and the basis of the head, neck, and locomotor systems. So this morning, we are going to have this particular lecture on local regulation of bone development and healing. However, it's really a sad morning for Bustema University. And uh, for this, I request that we observe a moment of silence for our foreign colleague, friend, sister, and name it Dr. Rosette Charikunda. May her soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you. Let us proceed. Uh, so what, what takes part in the regulation of uh, bone healing? I know you have looked at fracture repairs, all these things when the anatomy people taught you. But what are these particular components that are effective for this uh, process to take place? So in this area, we shall principally focus on three things and then uh, two additional ones. But these are basically the growth factors, and the main of these, I'm going to give highlights about them later on. And then the cytokines, very, very important. I will also have the prostaglandins and leukotrienes. If you remember very well your studying of, of uh, lipid structure and functions, you looked at arachidonic acid, which is uh, 20 carbon, and how it goes ahead to to, synth to lead the synthesis of the different T, uh, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, eicosatrienes, all those ones. So they are very, very critical. Then we have the hormones. Of course, they play a very important role. And uh, if I were to sum it up, hormones are very critical in this uh, fracture, healing, and bone repair. And finally, we have the growth factor antagonists. Like the name sounds, they really antagonize the process of growth, so through the growth factors. So we're going to look at each of these. Uh, we shall start with the growth factors. We have quite a number, but for purposes of this lecture and the, the general understanding of this uh, course unit, in this area of bone healing, we shall look at the transforming growth factor also abbreviated as TGF. Uh, we shall also look at the bone morphogenetic, morphogenetic proteins. And this one right from its name, I think you can have an idea now what it is used for or what they are used for. Then you have the fibroblast growth factors. We have the platelet-derived growth factors. Again, this one's from the name itself. You see its source. And then we have the insulin-like growth factors. So these are the growth factors that we are going to focus on for the purpose of this lecture. I know they are quite a number, but we can't exhaust all of them. Uh, however, it is important to understand some of the basics. And these are the basics, these five which I have highlighted here. Uh, the first one we shall look at under the growth factors are the transforming growth factors. What are they? What do they do? What happens when they are activated? So this is a super family of growth proteins. It has the approximate 34 members and they act on serine and threonine kinase cellular receptors. If you recall very well our signal transduction, 
We looked at these different receptors and how they bring about activation of particular pathways. So these ones, the TGFs act on serine kinase receptors. And once that signal is initiated, they promote proliferation and differentiation of mesenchymal precursors for osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and chondrocytes, depending on which one is going to come in to exert its effect. And as this, they hence further stimulate both endochondrial and intramembrous bony formation or rather ossification. I'm very sure in the lecture which you handled it this more yesterday, uh, Mr. Okalanga took you through the different types of ossification and by now you're very well conversant. And once that happens, there's induction of synthesis of cartilage-specific proteoglycans and type 2 collagen, which again, like we used to tell you earlier on during cell tissue and body systems, these things build onto each other. You are very conversant with collagen. Type 2 collagen is very important in some in the bone healing and the, the fracture healing as well. So what happened is stimulate collagen synthesis by osteoblasts. We know very well that osteoblasts are this, those cells which induce bone what? Formation. So it induces that process. Uh, that's just a brief about uh, transforming growth factors. So the next one, the bone morphogenetic proteins. Again, like I said, from its name, we're in position to tell what particular functions they do or give. So these are osteo osteoinductive, osteoinductive proteins, initially isolated from the mineralized bone matrix. Again, you have looked at bone matrix previously, so that's why they, are in, they were initially isolated. But over years, they have been proven to be formed in hetero, heterotopic muscle pouch in that area. Then what do they do? They induce cellular differentiation and of interest are some few identified and greatly class categorized types like a BMP3, which is osteogenin, is an extremely potent inducer of mesenchymal tissue differentiation into bone. So you can see if it is in its uh, present, of course, we shall have a bone healing setting in. Uh, then you also have those which promote endochondral ossification. And among these, we have uh, BMP2 and BMP7. And then also we have others which regulate extracellular matrix production. Again, if you recall uh, ossification, there are different steps and the formation of extracellular matrix is also very, very uh, important. BMP1 helps in cleavage of the carboxyl terminal procollagens 1, 2, and 3. Again, this helps for you previously in our lectures, we are looking at the synthesis of collagen, the steps it takes. So this BMP1 is very important in that particular component. Uh, we continue with our bone morphogenic proteins and they are included in the TGF beta family except BMP1. And there are different types and 16 have so far been described and were characterized. And we have already seen that BMP2, 7 and 9 are osteoinductive. BMP2, 6, and 9 may be the most potent in osteoblastic differentiation. Maybe, they may be. It's assumed that it would be because of tests, but they are yet to be confirmed. So they are involved in progenitor cell transformation to pre-osteoblasts. And how do they work? They achieve this through the intracellular SMAD pathway. I think you know about the SMAD pathway. Yes, 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 yes. I, I would do 
in the old days when we are having live lectures, I'm now told someone come and explain. Maybe Masawa Brian can you explain the smart pathway uh, so that we discuss it. But uh, please just understand that they work through that particular smart pathway. And then uh, they follow a dose response ratio their form of action. Again, we also have BMP antagonists. And these may have important roles in bone formation. Some of these include, for example, nogenin. And then uh, what does nogenin do? It is an extracellular inhibitor. Uh, it competes with BMP2 for receptors. So we know that, uh, for example, if it is competing with the potent BMPO in inducer, then it will have its effect coming in to reduce the activity. And we also have BMP13, which is found to limit differentiation of mesenchymal stromal cells. And right, how does it do this? By inhibiting osteogenic differentiation. Uh, from there, well, let us look at, at the fibroblast growth factors as another type of growth factors. Uh, here we have both acidic and basic forms and they they do principally one activity of increasing proliferation of chondrocytes and osteoblasts of course you know that proliferation is very important in the mineralization and also in the bony development or ossification processes they also enhance the color formation uh you recall very well the fracture healing process and then the fg2 FGF2 stimulates angiogenesis, which is again a very important feature or property in bony of fracture repair and healing. And let's look at the platelet derived growth factors. Uh, this is the name of the products of two genes, and these are PDGFA and PDGFB. Both of these are predominant forms found in circulation. They are always circulating. They stimulate bone growth. And also, for example, mitogen for cells of mesenchymal origin. And then what happens is that they increase type 1 collagen synthesis by increasing the number of osteoblasts. I think we observe here that the effect or activity of collagen is very important in the fracture repair, in bone healing. So anything that comes up to stimulate the activity will be very vital to the overall process of bony healing or fracture healing. And then we have the PG, PDGFBB which stimulate bone resorption by increasing the number of osteoclasts. Again, this is very important because uh, if the bone ha the bone mass has reached a stage where where there is there is need for a balance, then you can have osteoclastic activity coming in to pass on that effect, so that there is a balance and also we regulate the amount of calcium, the amount of uh, all those phosphates in the body. Again, this is something which you have learned during the past few days. And the, the activity of those uh, different hormones, the PTH, the calstonins, the calstriol or calcium, the different minerals. So the, the, their regulation is very important in the overall balance of bone density. Then I like us to look at one other growth factor, which is the insulin like a growth factor. And these are two types IGF1 and IGF2. They are synthesized by multiple tissues. And uh, IGF1 production in the liver is stimulated by growth hormone. You see, it has again come in here. What do they do? They stimulate bone collagen and matrix synthesis. And they also stimulate replication of osteoblasts, which we again saw that they are very, very important in the process 
of ossification. And then they inhibit bone collagen degradation because we know that degradation of bone collagen can result into osteoclastic activity and loss of bony density. We also have the cytokines. I know this is now uh, the COVID moment, you know, the COVID times where people talk about cytokine storms, they talk about different inflammatory mediators. So what are these cytokines? What are the different types? What do they do? How do they interplay and relate with the different activities? Probably with hormones, with growth, with, with degradation, resorption. How do they interplay? And we have examples like interleukin 1, 4, 6, 11, macrophage, granulocytes, macro and macrophages, colony stimulating factors, and tumor necrosis factors. These are some of the cytokines. But purpose of this lecture, I will focus on the most critical ones in this context, of which are well studied. And these are basically the interleukins. The interleukins, most of them, some of them, especially interleukin 1, is the most important in stimulation of bone resorption. And in, we see here that bone resorption is uh, very critical in areas where bone is being broken down. Bone density is being reduced. So when there is a lot of or high levels of interleukin 1, we see resorption taking it. Place. And of course, it affects the mineral density, the bone density. Then, IL1 and IL6 synthesis is decreased by estrogen. Again, this is one component or factor which you must well understand because we know that when estrogen levels are in constant check or they are in adequate amounts, we see that there is very low levels of bony resorption. And when they reduce, there is increased bone reception because of that counter, which is no longer there. I think this now explains the impossible mechanism for the post-monopausal bone resorption, for example, in uh, osteoporosis in women. We see it being more common in elderly women who are post-menopausal than it is for male counterparts of their age because of this level of estrogen which is highly diminished and thus the increased activity of bony resorption. This is by the very common mechanism that is usually asked in very very vivas in exams in theories name it so that point always remember then what happened that they peak in the first 24 hours, then they, during the remodeling process, and then this, they regulate the endochondral bony formation. Again, this again, this again is something which you have been doing very well, and I'm sure they taught you the other day, as I started by saying that Mr. Okalang was very good at this when he taught that topic. So I want us just to look at some of these uh, cytokines and their effect, whether they increase or decrease, they lead to bone formation or they lead to bone resorption. And this will now help you to explain what can happen if you have combinations of different cytokines. We have already seen that interleukin 1 plays a very small role in bone formation, but very high role in bony resorption. The same is for tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF beta, TNF alpha. Uh, these are very important in bony resorption. Then you see the different growth factors being very critical in bone formation rather than in bony resorption. So these combinations and the residual check on them allows us to tell which particular process will happen whether there will be osteoclastic activity or osteoblastic activity. And also gives insights into 
what happens when there's loss of act of function if you no longer produce enough growth factors if you have increased cytokines like i yellow one what do we expect if your hormonal level is not well regulated what happens so that's very very what important and by this i think it can help you to understand this process and the speed at which bone will actually remote that which speed will it be fully healed and what leads to other complications in different conditions and by the way i'm sure you are going to look at some when you start your pathology course you in such systematic pathology there is a course in third year which is called uh, this uh, diseases of the central nervous system peripheral nervous systems and uh, and uh, I think secretomuscular secretor systems. So this is just uh, an introduction. But when you reach that time, please try to remember this uh, component that this is what actually happens at such stages. Then you also have the prostaglandins and the leukotrienes. For them, they if affect, they have their effect on bone desorption in species dependent and their overall effect in humans is unknown. There are many studies quite a number of studies their own, but for humans there's still a lot that needs to be understood, but they are very important. Uh, those prostaglandins on E cells, we have the E, you remember those things E1, E whatever, E cosanoid, some of you. They stimulate osteoblastic bone formation and in civet activity of isolated osteo classes. These have been, of course, in the independent scientific studies and how it happens is in vivo, a lot is yet to be understood. Then you have the leukotrienes. They stimulate osteoblastic bone formation. Very, very important. Because you know that uh, once we have bone formation, it's the osteoblasts which are participating. So even if there was a wound, a, there was a fracture during the process of repair, of healing. These are those which are coming to help or stimulate such that we have easy recovery, early recovery, remodeling, transformation, angiogenesis, vascularization, so that you have your original bone reformed. They also enhance the capacity of isolated osteoclast to form resorption pits. So there's that uh, process, there's that interplay. They can have an activity in the osteoblastic performance and also in osteoclastic performance. But there, there should be a regulation. There should be some sort of control and balance and equilibrium. And this again explains why you are required in the earlier sessions for studying this particular concept of uh, biochemistry of uh, head, neck, and locomotor systems. Regulation of these minerals, the regulation of the different uh, ions, what how the hormones come in, what's the effect of PTH, so that you understand this balance. How does cholecalcifer come in? How does vitamin, how is vitamin D important? What is the role of the sun? All together. So, it's an interplay. These things don't occur in isolation. That's one important thing that you have to take home from this session. Uh, let's look at the hormones. Of course, I've already hinted that these hormones play vital roles. We have seen the effect of estrogen in countering the resorption process. For example, estrogen is not fracture healing through receptor mediated mechanisms. What is this mechanism? Can you have a chance to look at it and appreciate how it happens? Then we have the moderation. It's really moderate the release of specific inhibitor of interleukin 1. And of course, IL6. And I've already explained how this mechanism comes about. Once we have high levels of estrogen, we don't expect to have high levels of IL1. And thus, we expect reduced osteoclastic activity. I will ask again, why do postmenopausal women 
have high chances of loss of bone density as compared to their male counterparts of the same age group? Question mark. Of course, you know the answer. <laughs> I see Mwang was smiling and Esther and the rest. All right. Then you have thyroid hormone. And these ones uh, stimulate osteoclastic bony resorption. Certain day in second day, we shall be looking at the different hormones. And the thyroid hormones are those hormones which are actually some of the critical ones which are formed. Then you have the glucocorticoids. They inhibit cal calcium absorption from the gut, causing increased PTH. And therefore, increased osteoclastic bony resorption. Again, I have to remind you that you recall that moment when you are studying the regulation of these minerals. You have that skin PTH, calcium ions, you have magnesium ions, you have calcium, vitamin D, you have everything. The interplay, how it happens, is very important at such a moment. And all of these, once they are related, they re result into the affecting the process of bony healing. And uh, we also have parathyroid hormone. Uh, for this is important in the bone formation because it stimulates osteoblastic activity. Then we have growth hormone, which is mediated through IGF-1. Of course, you know somatomedin C, which is very important. And they increase callus formation and fracture strength. Thank you. Uh, additionally, we also have vascular factors. It's like actually you're trying to explain what happens along the entire process of bony healing. From the time we have this uh, callus, the vascularization, the antigenesis. So we have metalloproteinases, which degrade cartilage and bones to allow invasion of vessels. Yes, you know that state, that process of angiogenesis and what have you. We have angiogenic factors, which mediate neoangiogenesis and endothelial cell mm -hmm. specific mitogens. And finally, we have angiopoietin 1 and 2, which regulate formation of larger vessels and branches. Of course, this happens later on when the bone has actually reached that state of almost completely healing. Uh, this will be our second last slide on this topic. We don't only have these local modulators. There are other systematic systemic factors, and this decrease fracture healing. So when you are undergoing that process of recovery, try to avoid this. Even when you become medics, you become nurses, and others, and you are called to intervene, give an intervention plan, a management plan. Try to advise your patients on some of these areas. Like malnutrition, certainly. They do the active time proliferation of endochondro, osteochondro cells. They decrease callus formation because you don't have the required nutrients. So nutrition is important when you want proper fracture healing. We also have smoking. Cigarette smoke inhibits osteoblasts. Because there's a presence of nicotine that causes vasoconstriction, diminishing blood flow at fracture sites. You see? The science, the science behind is very, very important. So please advise someone telling you are smoking, but you already have a, a fracture. It's going, it's going to take longer to heal because of this compound which is present. Then we have diabetes mellitus. It's associated with collagen defects, including decreased collagen content, defective cross-linking, and alteration in collagen subtype ratios. So people who have diabetes mellitus, of course, you have to have supportive interventions. Make sure they have enough nutrition. You have, the, you have their medication. They're in the right environment, even state of mind. So that these diseases oh, don't come in to affect the whole process and they take a long to go on bed as opposed to their counterparts who are healthy. And finally, we have anti-inflammatory medications. They cause at least a temporary reduction in bone healing. How that happens? It will be interesting to find out. Uh, there were other studies where they were looking at uh, ultrasound. What does ultrasound do? Does it increase the bone healing? All these have been studied, but uh, 
The most important thing now is that once we have a combination of all of these factors, we have the growth factors, we have the hormones, we have the proteins, we have everything, we have the systemic factors. Once they're all in check and balance, given the right quantities at a particular moment, then your bone will heal at a faster rate, as opposed to those ones which are not well maintained. The orthopedics people have a saying that bone will always heal, or a fracture will always heal, a bone will always heal, get repaired, Dep anytime, anywhere, depending on... Uh, I usually forget how that statement is stated, but uh, the thing is, whether you come in and give an intervention or not, once it aligns, it will repair. But uh, we need uh, we need orthopedic intervention such that uh, there is no more alignment and the proper what? recovery. Uh, I think this brings us the end of this particular topic. And uh, I would like to share with you some of the reading materials for this particular session. I also implore you and the hope that you have been reading the other preparatory research concepts. You know the different factors. You now know the muscle contraction process. You know energy utilization cycles. You know how osteo how ossification takes place. You know the regulation of the different the different minerals and their effect in the mass and bony processes. I'm sure Mr. Kalanga told you about the different molecular basis of embryology of the head, neck, and locomotor systems, the sonic hedgehogs, the Indian hedgehogs, among others, those genes. Uh, Professor Sangin, I'm sure, has already taught you 